You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the book, Long Walk Up, Portia, Love More Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. Good morning, good morning out there in Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio Land. We are coming down the home stretch in August 2020, believe it or not. Before we kick off this morning show, I want to start with an anonymous quote, and that quote is, Great things never come from comfort zones, as good as comfort feels. Remember, great things never come from comfort zones. And I want to welcome you to our loyal listeners. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here with us from the very beginning. 16 years and running. If this is your first time coming over to Off the Shelf, you are absolutely listening to the winning book radio show, Off the Shelf. And I want to welcome you to this Saturday, August the 22nd, 2020. Before we introduce to you, our guest this morning. We're going to be talking about historical fiction this morning. I'm excited. This is something that is is, is entertaining, is, is educational. You can learn from it while you're being entertained, especially if you have those awesome multifaceted characters that the author brings to you in his books. But before I introduce to you our awesome guest this morning, I want to ask you, how good of a mystery sleuth are you? Do you think you can figure out who's responsible for the murder mystery that coaxed Raymond and his friend's life in love pour over me? I mean, if you love mystery, there's some fast-paced scenes in this story. It takes place on a campus in Philadelphia. You've got some of it in Ohio and then Tennessee and Africa. And you will learn a lot about each of these places. But if you like suspense, and I mean some of these tight scenes, those tight corner scenes, go get a copy of Love for Over Me. But it is the other things you get from Love for Over Me, if you value relationships and love, there's a soulmate relationship between Raymond and Brenda, and they can meet, meet in college in Pennsylvania. But And it's these four friends. I mean, these dudes are from all over the world. They come to college at, at, a, at a university in Pennsylvania, and their friendship lasts a lifetime. But does, is one of them involved in the murder? Is one of them involved in a murder? If, if you love mystery, if you love relationships, I mean, stop what you're doing and treat yourself to a copy of Love Pour Over Me. It's in ebook and in print format. Just look for Love Pour Over Me by Denise Turney. And now let us go and meet our very special off-the-shelf guest. And our special guest this morning is Neil Gordon. Now, Neil, like I was telling you at the start, he writes historical fiction, and his books include The Bomb Squad, A Cobbler's Tale, Moonflower, The Righteous One, and Hope City. I love that title, Hope City. I encourage you to check Neil out online at neilperrygordon.com, and that's spelled N-E-I-L, P. I got to remember that because I'm thinking N-E-A-L, N-E-I-L, P-E-R-R-Y, G-O-R-D-O-N.com. Again, that's N-E-I-L, P-E-R-R-Y, G-O-R. D O N dot com. We are absolutely honored to have Mr. Neil Gordon with us here on Off the Shelf this morning. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Neil. Well, thank you, Denise. Thank you for that lovely introduction. It is it is an honor to have. I, when I think Neil, I think N E A L. I got to get myself out of that N E I L. Mm-hmm. I've been marketing and promoting the day show. N E I L N E I L. Never gonna forget the spelling of your name. Again, it's just a pleasure to have you here with us this morning. The first few questions I ask, I'm going to ask you, Neil, I ask every guest on Off the Shelf okay. because I'm going back to the beginning when I used to just go right into the questions, and then I got emails from listeners, and they're like, no, tell us a little bit about the guests before you start into their books. So to kick it off, can you tell Off the Shelf listeners where you grew up and what life was like for you growing up? Well, I grew up in the uh, northwest suburb of New York City, a county called Rockland County, and a little community called Chestnut Ridge. And it's a small suburban 
community. I live not far from there now. Um, and uh, I went, what really I think sort of um, format, gave me the foundation of who I am today was my education. As a young child, I went to a, a school called the Waldorf School, which is in Chestnut Ridge, New York. It's still there. It's, it's based on the uh, Waldorf education. There's, there's schools all over the world that are based on that. It's from the teachings of Rudolf Steiner. Uh, and it's a school that focuses on uh, learning through the arts. Um, so that was really where I got a lot of my, uh, who I am today, uh, gives me my foundation in wanting to express myself creatively. So, you know, it's, it's been, that's been the, uh, the, really what's been my background and my desire to be creative and find outlets to, to, to be creative. And so I think that's, that's really where it all stems from. New York, New York. You know, how many times yeah. have I heard about these types of schools that, that focus on either more the art, the theater, or the arts? I, I, it's almost always only hear this when people say they went to school in New York. I wish this mm. was something that happened nationally. I just think that the, some of the, uh, whether it's just a, they're great during a certain time period or their work expands beyond, you know, the time they were here, but a lot of great artists come out of these. They they went to these types of schools. Uh, some of them go to schools in like a uh, D.C. Baltimore area, but then you see what comes of this person. I think there's something they should they should consider doing nationally. Go New York. Now, as a kid, Neil, what did you what did you want to be when you were a kid? What did you say when I grew up? I want to be. Well, I wanted to be working my father's store. I mean, that's what I wanted. My father and my grandfather all had stores, uh, houseware stores. And so my goal as a child was to work like my father, uh, side by side with him in the store. To me, that was what I always wanted. Um, and I did it for a while, actually, uh, until I had my – I broke off and um, not too many years after I graduated college and, and really got on my own. But, you know, as a child, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be right by my father's side. Oh, <laughs> that is awesome! And so you, I'm sure there are things you learn from that that you can incorporate into your writing, um, and oh, also marketing, sure. marketing uh, from that as well. So, what, who, right. or what inspired? I know you talked about the school you went to in New York. Was mm-hmm. there any specific person who inspired you to pursue writing, and what birthed your love for books? I think it's storytelling more than writing itself. Um, you know, that was something that um, I've always loved as a child. And, you know, one thing that the Waldorf teachings do well is they, they teach through an experiential type of uh, environment. So it's, you know, you're, you're learning through dealing, you're learning through experience, you're learning through, through taking it into all five senses. So that to me, I think really gave me a, a, a lot of, of, of the desire to, to write. Um, not that I wanted to be a writer at that young of an age, but I did always want to be a storyteller. I always did want to be up on stage communicating to people. And a lot of my, and, and through a whole my business career, that's what I've done, um, being up there and trying to be in the limelight, so to speak, and, and, and be able to be confident in front of, of, of people, of many people, uh, and, and, and communicate. Um, to me, that is the ultimate. That's why we write. I mean, the, the best writers are those who know how to telepathically communicate from, from the writer's brain into the reader's brain. That's really what it's all about. So that whole idea of, uh, of communication ex- and expression, I think, is, is, uh, speaks a lot of, of, of how I grew up. How old were you when you knew you worked in your father's store for a while? You went to mm-hmm. the school in New York. But how old were you when you realized I, you, you, you talked about the storytelling but when you knew for sure that you were going to write books, how old were you? Curious. <laughs> I always, I always love this answer that well, writers give. Right. Well, you know, I didn't write my first book until uh, until it was published. Was uh, I, I started writing in 2017? It was published in 2018. So I've published five books from the year 2017 until 2020. So in the past three years, this October will be the third year where actually I put my pen to paper, so to speak, and and started writing. So, I, you know, it's like you imagine saying, wow, you've, you've done that all in that short time. But, you know, yeah, I, I did the I, I went through the process of writing in these past 
several years and writing five books. I have another manuscript that's done, and I'm working on a, another one on top of that, um, which would soon be published. But I look at it as all the years leading up to that. Um, someone said to me, what, don't you regret not starting to writing, writing your, your writing career earlier in your life? And I'm like, no, because I don't think I could have done it early in my life. I don't think I had what I have now, and I was able to do it in my 30s or 40s or, or 50s. So, you know, now, like I started in my you know, late 50s writing, but um, I, I couldn't have done it at a, a younger age. It just wasn't the right moment. Um, so you know, though, they, all those you, years did lead up to being able to, to, to do what I do now. You never think of it that way. There's a quote I, I read. Uh, I was working on some future off-the-shelf shows uh, last night, and one of the quotes I read was, you know, the best time to, to have planted a tree was 20 years ago because of how long it takes a tree to grow. So uh, right. uh, everything you did, we're doing, though, as, a, as an artist, it's all material for your work. It's all, you know, you, I hear songwriters say, I, got, I had to just step away from the studio and go out there and live so I could get some more material for my, when I do come back in the studio, it's life. That's where we get our material from. Now now to go into your books, what's the inspiration behind, and is this your first book, Neil, uh, A Cobbler's Tale? Yeah, that was my first book. Um and the inspiration behind it is actually um, was, was inspired by my family's story. So the story is about um, my great-grandparents who emigrated to America in the early 1900s, like millions of other Jews did from Eastern Europe. And as I was told, as the story was handed down, in the traditional storytelling fashion um, from generation to generation, I was told that my great-grandfather, Pincus, um, left southern Poland um, in 1910, uh, left his family behind, his pregnant wife and three children, one of which was my grandfather, left them behind while he came to America, uh, to the Lower East Side in New York, and uh, he was a cobbler. He, his father was a cobbler. He was a cobbler. So he came here to establish himself in business. Uh, which he did, and then his plan was to come back to uh, Poland and bring his family um, back to, to New York, which many, many families did. You, a lot of this was very common where the, 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 the man would go first, establish themselves before they bring the family over, because you can imagine picking up your whole life, moving halfway across the world to a place that no one speaks your language, uh, and starting all over, it would be nice, you know, to have something, um, you know, in place before everybody got there. So that was the plan. But what happened was World War I broke out, uh, and he mm. couldn't go back uh, to go get them. And they, they lived out many years in the war um, in, in a war zone where the, um, the Russians were fighting the Austrian-Hungarian army. Um, right, right in their backyard. So that was the basis of the story. That was the inspiration of the story. I took it from there, and of course, I made my great grandfather much more heroic than I think he really was. Uh, wow! And I'm, so of course, how, embellished. How, oh my good! How Go much is you know? And you know what? I think that is so wonderful. We have the 23 and Me. People want to know about their genealogy, and when Alex Haley came out with Roots, people wanted to start to research their own ancestry, right. which I think is wonderful. It tells us a lot about ourselves because it's amazing. Somebody three, four generations ago, you find out, oh my God, I'm kind of like my great, 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 great aunt or something. You mm-hmm. know, you, how it all connects. How how loosely or closely did you keep a cobbler's tale to the actual actual events that happened to your relative uh, Pincus. Mm, not maybe twenty five percent. I kept it accurate. I, I kept I kept the events, the timeline accurate, basically, which is I, what I try to do mostly with my historical fiction. Is I try to stay true to the timeline. Um, I won't say you know. This happened in this year when it actually happened the year after or the year before. That just would dis- disqualify me using in the story. So that's how I justify my historical events in my fiction. Um, but what my great grandfather, who he really was, I mean, he was people um, never spoke highly of him, and you know, he actually 
never he he didn't go back to Europe until after the war, but in my book he goes back during the war and makes a daring rescue. So you know, of course, I had to make this a much more interesting story because you know, I have to entertain yeah. people as well. Uh, so you know, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind. You know, wherever he is, if he's up wherever, he is listening or watching or reading up in heaven to hear about how I. Uh, made him so courageous and adventurous. I mean, who uh, wouldn't mind having that legacy in your life? Now, who is Jacob Adler, and when did Pincus and Jacob meet? Jacob is a totally fictitious character. He was a, he was like, he lived in Warsaw during that time, also a Jew, and he was escaping um, Poland, uh, not for immigration reasons, but because he got himself in trouble with some gangsters in Poland and Warsaw. So they met on the boat, on the steamship, heading from, uh, Hamburg, which was where the steamships left from, uh, to New York. So they met there and they became friends. An, an unlikely pairing where Jacob Badley was a tall, strong, strapping young man and, and Pincus was meek and wore wire rim glasses and, you know, n- n- not a very sturdy man at all. Uh, so these two sort of made this connection, this unlikely couple, uh, and um, that's, they became friends. How is Pincus, how old, how old is Pincus when he heads for New York? And he's married. How many kids does do he and his wife have? And I was going to ask you, how is he able? Now, you have him go back and rescue them, but he is away from them for so long. When he left, how long did he tell his, his wife, I'll only be gone for six months or whatever? And how long did it turn into and how is he? How much of a struggle do you present? <laughs> how much of a struggle do you present in the cobbler's tale that that is for him being away from oh, his family? Oh wow, that's the whole story. You just described all the interesting parts of the story of all those <laughs> questions you just asked are all in there. That's all the reason behind the story. Now you know why I embellished it because, as you can imagine, all the questions that you just asked me, I focus on those same questions and and, and created this story. So he's about thirty five years old. When he leaves, he's got three children uh, already. As I said before, his wife is – one of them is my grandfather. His, the, his wife, Clara, is pregnant with their fourth. So he leaves his pregnant wife and three children home alone, which in, in a soon-to-be war zone. Um, mm. He in, – in back in that time um, in, in Europe, when they lived in what's called a shtetl, which was a, a Jewish ghetto – um, poor Jewish families live in a village or in a village with other people, but they gathered together, as you would expect people of the same kind to do. Um, you know, there was two types of men. There was the men who were the Torah scholars. They were the respected men. They were the intellectuals. They were the smartest boys in the shtetl, and they went on just to study the Torah. And that was their career. They would just, you know, wake up in the morning, <laughs> go to synagogue, and study the Torah. And you can still see that today in Hasidic communities, um, you know, where you, have, you find, you know, com, you know, these Coptic congregations. So back, back then, that was what everybody did. So there was the, the Torah scholars, and then there were the other boys, and soon to be men, who went into a craft, uh, a father's business. Uh, they became a tailor, or a butcher, or a baker, or, or a shoemaker, a cobbler. Um, and they were typically not as respected as the intellectual boys, the Torah scholars. And, you know, for a young woman to marry a Torah scholar back then was like, you know, you, you hit the jackpot. And it was, you know, not as good, even though you could probably make a good living by marrying the butcher's son, so to speak, if you remember Fiddler on the Roof. So, um, so he was never respected. And he, he had a chip on, the, on his shoulder, pink as this. But when he came to America, and when he came here in um, – 1910, with millions of Jews, and 500,000 Jews lived in the Lower East Side in 1910. There was the largest Jewish population in the world at that time. And so you can imagine a cobbler among 500,000 Jews, and how many shoes must that be? He was very successful, and all of a sudden he was very respected, and he was the man, and all those other Jews who came over, who were the intellectuals, the Torah scholars, they had nothing to do. (laughs) Okay, you're, so what can you do? Well, wow. I can study the Torah, but this, I'm sorry, my friend, there's nothing here for you. We have no jobs. But the craftspeople, the butchers, the bakers, the tailors, the cobblers, they all were busy, busy, busy. So he Isn't got himself, you know. Yeah, so that was quite interesting. 
So that's why he got himself sort of stuck here. I also have this whole other story, big part of the story with these Jewish gangsters too being involved and Jacob Adler um, getting himself involved uh, with these Jewish gangsters and, and mixing his business in with the cobbler business and getting Pinkus in trouble as well with him. Um, and sort of this is how this uh, story intertwines and why he became very distracted and sort of forgot to go back to get his family, which he was supposed to do in about a year or so. He promised, I'll be back, Clara. I'll be back in a year to come get you. And, uh, you know, three years later, uh, or four years later, World War I broke out. And he was like, oh, my God, now I can't go back. Oh, my gosh. That's what I'm thinking of Pinkus. I'm pu- I'm pulling for him, and it's, I love how you flip the tables. So he goes, if he had stayed in Europe, he, he would have been like the underdog. He comes to the U- U.S. and New York, and he's like, like the guy, you know. He's uh, the man, yeah. He's t- right. t- tons of business, but that he could he could forget his family for that long. Even I mean, before the war broke out, he could get so caught up here that he's mm. that's a long time. That really is. A long time. uh, Yeah, it kind of says something about uh, Pincus. Could you introduce us to other, some of the other major and minor characters in a cobbler's tale? People who readers would really, readers are either going to attract to or they're like, ooh, I don't like him or I don't like her. Mm. But could you introduce us to someone? For sure, because the the, the, the next major character I'm about to describe is also the major character in The Righteous One, my third book, which is a sequel to A Cobbler's Tale. And that's my grandfather, uh, Moshe Potasnik. Um, so Moshe was a child, was a young boy in, in The Cobbler's Tale, and he had this gift. He had a special metaphysical gift where uh, he could soothe people in the times of stress. So he would be able to someone to comfort you as to if someone was passing right before they were passing and they were in distress, he would come comfort them. And he had this magical way of making them feel at ease. Um, he also had this ability of force foreshadowing or foretelling of a bad event that would happen. And he would have this um, reaction of getting very sick before uh, a terrible event would happen. Um, mm. And so he had this empathy, this super empathy that was quite unique. So the rabbi looked at him and studied him and, 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 and knew about him and, and thought he was what's called a tzaddik. And a tzaddik is in terms of Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism, that there's only 36 tzaddik on the earth at any one time. And tzaddik are considered the hands of God. So he had this hand of God. So when he was able to comfort someone about to pass, he was basically channeling God to this person. So he had this Gill. So, and he was a child, and so, of course, during the war, I have some war scenes in there where he's comforting these people as they're they are wounded and about to pass on to the other side. So, so Moshe is a major character, and it becomes even more so in The Righteous One, which is my third book, um, where he takes that, he becomes sort of the reluctant Sadiq. He's now 60 years old and in The Righteous One, and he has, he's, he's, in, he's in New York, he's in the Bronx, living in the Bronx. A uh, 60-year-old man, um, also a cobbler, following in his father and grandfather's footsteps um, on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx, and he's recruited to fight the evil counterpart of the tzaddik, which is called the rasha. So everything in life has balance. Of course, we have the tzaddik. We have to have the balance to the tzaddik, which is the rasha, which is the evil counterpart. So he is called upon by Jewish members in the community to fight this Rasha, who has this uh, amazing ability of able to uh, foresee the future in his dreams. So the only way to fight the Rasha is to make this battle in the dream world. So he mm. has to be able to learn how to live in the dream world through lucid dreaming and ends up in this metaphysical battle between good and evil. Interesting. That is interesting. I love how you describe your stories. That said, and then the, the history part of it, and you've got major events occurring in A Cobbler's Tale with World War I breaking out. He, he's, his family is, I think his family's starting to expand. He's coming 
he's having this this change. Well, some people say you're at the very beginning or soon to start midlife crisis. He's 35. That's another major shift. And then he's he's he, he goes from being the underdog to the man in New York. You've got all these major things that really any any reader knows how much a, a shift like that rocks can rock your life and take you a while to adjust to it. You've got all this going on in a cobbler's tale. What have readers been saying about a cobbler's tale? Oh, well, I get terrific reviews. I have. Um about 60 four- and five-star reviews on Amazon, as well as uh, editorial reviews as well. So all my books get well-reviewed. Um, um, so I, that is a very gratifying process of hearing back from people reading your book. Because unlike other art forms, you know, reading a book takes a long time. Now, you can go mm-hmm. to a museum and see art, and you'll be done in a couple hours, or you could go to a concert and also be done in a couple of hours and, and enjoying the art. But if you're sitting down and reading a book, it could take you days or weeks for some people, or sometimes even months to get through a book. So people are investing a lot in, uh, time in your art in your, in your, in, in, in what you're producing. And so when they come back and they express their gratitude and um, exuberance over what you've written. That's very satisfying. Where Now I want to talk about one of your other books. Where and when is your book Hope City set? Hope City is set in the year 1900. Uh, it's set in Alaska um, on a small uh, mining village called Hope, which is still there today. And it's a place that I visited over a dozen times over the past dozen years, except this year which was very disappointing because this year I was going to be launching my book in hope. <laughs> um, but of course with COVID, I couldn't go. So yeah. um, it was, it was disappointing that this, you know, this happened, but at the same time I have a good friends up there who were able to take my place and, and uh, my book has sold well in the hope community because it's a very, uh, it's a very touristy spot in the summer. So it's been in several outlets and people are buying it as souvenirs. It tells the story of how Hope uh, was back in 1900 as a mining town because there was gold there found uh, in the creeks um, as lo- alongside another city called Sunrise, which is not there anymore. I said that's an abandoned city. In fact, if you go hiking into the woods of where Sunrise is, you can find some of the things that were left over, like an old cemetery or parts of a brick wall um, or different types of posts that are around. So um, that's an abandoned city. Hope is still there. And um, I, I got the inspiration from actually last summer when I was there, um, there's a new restaurant that opened called the Dirty Skillet. And the woman who runs it, her name is Janine. She was telling me how uh, the history, what she knew of that hope being discovered um, or, the, or the, the name of the town uh, coming to fruition was basically by someone coming off a boat back in 1900 and uh, saying, well, some person saying, the next person who steps onto the land here, we will get to name our city after that person. And, and the person who stepped off the boat was Percy Hope. So I took that seed of an idea and I developed my story. Um, Hope City, The Alaskan Adventures of Percy Hope, book one. You know, it's amazing. You start, you, 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 you're, um, as a historical fiction writer, I really appreciate how you you take the reader not you know some writers keep it which is fine and and can work wonderfully but some writers keep the reader the story in one every 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 book they write is in the same city I was kind of surprised when I asked you and you said oh you know the, we're going from Europe to New York and now we're in Alaska <laughs> it kind of <laughs> threw me for a minute when you said it's in in a, in, a, in Alaska. Um, I had a cousin who lived there. He just loved Anchorage. He loved, he loved uh, there. So Hope City, never heard of it. Is it close to Anchorage or another big city in Alaska? Yeah. And what, what is? And this, this is in when you say the 1900s, like 19 what? And what's the town like at the start of when this book uh, launches? Okay, actually, the year is 1898. Hope okay. City is well. Back in 1898, Anchorage did not exist. So um, where it, but if, and today you, I, my friend's main home 
is in Anchorage, and we drive from Anchorage to Hope, which takes about an hour and a half. You go around what's called the Turnagain Arm, which is an inlet, a long inlet where Hope resides upon on the shores. Um, so uh, that's, that's where this, this, the town exists. Back in 1898, it was just a couple of streets, uh, muddy streets with uh, cladded, wood-cladded buildings uh, making up Main Street. And, and, um, and uh, we, you have basic, basic um, necessities there. You had the mining supply store. You had a cafe. Um, you had a, a general store. Um, uh, what happened, though, back, back then in 1898, Sunrise was the bigger of the two cities. In fact, in 1898, Sunrise was the, the most populated city in all of Alaska. There was, they say, 5,000 people were living in Sunrise back then in 1898. No one lives there now, like they said, it's abandoned. But back then, it was um, the city to be in. And they were there for gold mining. You know, everyone flocked in to, to mine the gold there. So we have Hope, and 14, down, 14 miles down the arm, down Turnigan Arm, lived Sunrise. And Hope was a dry city, which means no alcohol. Um, and Sunrise was the city where we had alcohol and we had gambling and we had the saloons and we had all the, the frolicking that people like to participate in. So in my story, I have Hope and Sunrise as the good sister and the bad sister. The good sister is Hope, where you know, we have the reverend and the Catholic church and everyone is trying to, to do the right thing according to God. And, you know, God forbid there should be drinking and gambling and whores. Whereas in sunrise, we let, you know, things go as they would like to go. And, you know, a lot, lot of freedom and a lot of wild things going on. So that gives a little bit of a setting of, of what, the, what it was like in 1898. I love the descriptions of your story. Stories. You talk about your stories like they're speaking of historical fiction, like it's something that really happened. Can you introduce off the shelf listeners to Samuel Rothman? What's Samuel like? How old is he? How did he get to Hope City, and what what is he like? Well, Samuel Rothman is my my protagonist, and Samuel Rothman is a seventeen year old boy in San Francisco. He 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 and his friend Liam just graduated high school, and they and they find out about the gold rush in Alaska, and they decide they want to go up for the summer, two 17-year-old boys up for the summer to their fortune. Um, but Samuel, uh, you know, he's a Jewish boy. His father says, before you go, I think it's probably a good idea that you don't tell people your real name, but Samuel is off, and they're going to figure out you're a Jew, and you might not be so welcomed up there with all those ruffians. So why don't you change your name to a, you know, more of a common name, so they, him and his mother and father are tossing around, and, Sam, and Samuel goes, what about Percy? And they're like, oh, yeah, I like that name. What about a second name? And the mother says, oh, it should be something really wonderful. How about Hope? And they go, yes, Percy Hope. What a great name. So Samuel Rothman becomes Percy Hope. He takes this alias up there, and when he steps off the boat, the evil character in my story, Magnus Vega, who's controlling all the, the town, he says the next person who steps off this boat to his security chief, Stan Smith, standing alongside him, will be, will name the town after him. And lo and behold, yeah. it's young Percy <laughs> Hope who steps off. Oh, my God. Okay. So the town is named Hope, Hope City, after the young Percy Hope, who's really a Jewish boy from San Francisco named Samuel Rothman. I, I'm not going to ask you. I want to ask you if they ever find out. Um, and it's just, I think it's just tragic that uh, as humans, we get so caught up in some of the stupidest things. Like, uh, okay. it's, 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 it just, it is unimaginable. It's, it's, we're all the same. It's just almost, it's just, it's like, it's total, absolute ignorance to me. Yeah. But so they're That's teenagers when. Too. Yeah, they're ahead, teenagers. They're so teenagers. they're teenagers when they go, uh, and you know, whenever I hear about like the gold rush, I always think California. I don't think Alaska. Do they? Do well, nineteen forty nine was the gold rush in California. Nineteen was so you, you heard of? Of course, you know the San Francisco Forty ers right? So the, the gold rush of nineteen forty nine was the in in, San, in Sacramento was the, was the gold rush in nineteen forty nine, and then in eighteen ninety six, the next big gold rush was in the Klondike which was in Canada, not far from 
these guys in Alaska. That was that was a big big gold rush up there. 1898, we have the gold rush in Hope and in Sunrise, and in 1900, we have the gold rush in Nome, Alaska, which is my new book, my book two to Hope City, which is called Cape Nome, and it's the gold rush uh, in Nome, Alaska, the Alaska Adventures of Percy Hope book two. So would it be giving the story away? If so, then don't answer. Do uh, Samuel and Liam, do they do they um, meet with good fortune? Do they meet good fortune? Do they have good fortune here oh, in Hope City? All I can say is that all my books have happy endings. Oh, how wonderful. Okay. Now, how mm-hmm. much influence does Reverend O'Hara have on Hope City? Oh, big time. He is like, he controls it because he's the, he's the reverend there of the Catholic Church. Everyone honors what he says. Hope is a dry town because of the reverend. So we have Magnus Vega, who is controlling Sunrise. His saloon, the Gold Digger Saloon, is raking it in with all the people, you know, prospecting for gold. And he wants to infiltrate Hope, open up a saloon in Hope. But, of course, he's got the reverend to contend with who's trying to put a big stop to it. So, yeah, there's a lot of tension between good and evil here, um, and that's really the, the basis of this, this story as well. Um, so we, we see this, and, of course, Percy is put into this position where he is on this, become put on this pedestal uh, as this reluctant hero, um, as, it's, as actually as this reluctant savior um, by the reverend. And so he, he's, he sort of goes, it's like a trip down the rabbit hole for him. All these strange things happen. Um, during this, during these couple of months, um, up, now in, I was up in Alaska, say, no. Now I was going to say, all is not all is not easy for Samuel or Percy. Does he see the trouble? It doesn't sound like he does. His parents make a suggestion changing his name, but does he see the trouble that he's getting into early on, or is he literally blindsided by the trouble? No, he's no, he 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 he's put right in the fire pit. So he. You know, not because he's a Jew, because really no one ever really finds that out um, throughout much of the story. That's what, but he he finds it out because he gets him, he he's living a lie. So the fact that he's living this lie gets him in all this trouble. So you know, and he 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 has to constantly uh, justify uh, his behavior, which is a conflict for him um, that he's living this lie, while people are admiring him for who he is. You know, put it you know by the by the Reverend who's admiring him so, and and these events that unfold that he's always in the center of attention around. So, yeah, so, you know, he, he's in a lot of conflict. He's, he's always trying to find his way. Um, and uh, that's what makes him the, you know, everyone, no one wants a perfect hero. So, you know, he's, he's no. quite imperfect. I love how you worked at the, the, the situations you put your characters in, and it makes them so intriguing so intriguing. Now, how much research? I can tell you're very knowledgeable about the the his the history, historic events you do you write about. You're you're knowledgeable about the where you place your characters. How much research? But I mean, certainly off the top of your head, you wouldn't know everything. How much research do you do before you actually sit down to start writing one of your books? Well, I'll research the time period to see what what's what happened during that time period. Um, any, so if I, you know, I know like the, the book I'm writing now is, um, called Cape Nome. So the research I've been doing for that is I would look at Nome, Alaska, who was there in 1900, who, what, because it was such a, uh, a, you know, 30,000 people flocked to Nome, Alaska, where there was basically nothing. It was desolate, not even indigenous life. I mean, here and there, there was some tribes, but not many indigenous people living there at all. So from nothing to 30,000 people, why? You know, why, what made this happen? So I, I did research for that. I found out about the three lucky Swedes who were the ones who first discovered the gold and became millionaires. I learned that Wyatt Earp, the famous lawman from the OK Corral, moved up there with his wife, Josephine, and opened up the Dexter Saloon. I learned that, um, you know, there was uh, gold found on the beach sand itself uh, where all these people all of a sudden claimed beachfront by just, you know, plopping down their tents and shovels and started digging into the sand and pulling out gold out of the sand. So wow. you know, all of that leads to a colorful background. That's what I use the, the history 
the historical part of the historical fiction on. I, I want to find background. I want to find color to my story, um, a place to, to, to set it in. I don't know. In a way, for me, it's like cheating because they, they're giving me the setting. They're giving me the backdrop. I don't have to make all of it up. Um, I'm sort of like, okay, I'm going to place my, my story into this world and let me try to, you know, get what would, what would have been like for the characters living back then uh, during a gold rush, during this, this bizarre time when people were all just chomping at the earth, trying to get rich. It was just for pure greed, you know, where, in, you know, and, and, and in hope, you know, there were indigenous people. And part of my story during, in the hope story, hope city story is that the indigenous people lived there before. And if, it was a, if there was a gold nugget laying on the ground, they'd walk right by it. The, yeah. They would never pull anything from the earth. It was, if it's in the earth, it should stay in the earth. You know, if, if that was the law of the land, if that was the law of the planet, of whatever's in the earth needs to stay in the earth, we would have a sustainable earth, <laughs> not one in yeah. the So, you know, wow. we're, and we're still doing it. We're still blowing up things in Canada, smithereens. If you watch those gold rush shows, they got these heavy equipment. They're blowing the the, uh, the earth into smithereens, trying to get down to the bedrock to find gold. And mm. what do we leave in its wake? You know, we leave devastation yeah. and disaster for some men to put gold in their pockets. And then, the, and then the the way uh, when we get greedy, the way we treat each other, we devalue we devalue each other, so we can almost excuse ourselves to be greedy. I'll step on you, and that's okay because I'm trying to get this gold nugget. <laughs> <laughs> so if I step on exactly. your throat, and, right. and has things changed today? Look yeah. at us, look at look at the world we're in today. It's 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 it's, it's just exemplified in, in everything you turn around and look at. Yes. Now, I, who illustrated Hope City's book cover? Who who did oh, the illustration for? Uh, I love you. Yes, that question. Thank you. Well, um, there's an artist in Hope. Her name is Erica Miller. She's a friend who I met going up there. She's a friend of Tom and Miller, not related. Tom Miller and Barbara Miller are my friends who live up there, and Tom is, has, has been in Hope for dozens of years already. Erica lives there. She's a local artist. So when I was doing the book, I asked her if she would do the cover. So she said, sure, and she used the model for my cover for Percy Hope, Tom's son, whose, whose name happens to be Sam, Sam Miller. So it's Sam Miller's. Uh, image that he posed for her for the uh, for the artwork for the cover of Hope City. So yeah, it's very very special, um, especially when it sits on uh, you know up in the in the Hope uh, bookstore or in the Hope City gift shop or in the dirty skillet on the counter where they're selling the books. And yes, you have this picture painted by Erica Miller representing Tom's son Sam who's playing Percy Hope, written by me. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, very, fascinating. Nice you know, and tied in. What, a gr- what a great idea, though, to name a book after the town for any authors listening. and and But not only just that, it's, it's historical fiction. So let's say somebody doesn't know anything about, uh, before we move on to talking about the Bomb Squad, before, if somebody didn't know anything about Hope City, or let's say, and this would probably be almost, I would think very very difficult. They didn't know much about the part of New York that 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 um, uh, uh, accomplished Taylor study in. Could they yeah. read your books and walk away knowing a lot about these places? Is do you stick that close as far as talking about the towns themselves? Yes. To what? Yes. I, yeah, that's my goal because that's what I like when I read a book. I like reading historical fiction because I want to learn about the time and at the same time be entertained, which I think you referenced that in your introduction. So, uh, yeah, I try to do the same and, and give background to what it was like so you could imagine what was it like being stepping off the boat in 1898 into Hope, walking, walking into the town, or what was it like coming off the ship and going through Ellis Island immigration uh, and being interviewed and, and, and walking into America for the first time with your releases and your two hands and, and only speaking Yiddish and not knowing which way to turn right or left and your life is about to, you know, have a rebirth. <laughs> so, you know, what, is it, what would it have felt like? You know, and, and what I've learned writing is that the idea here is to educate. You know, I want you to feel something when you're reading my book, good or bad. I mean, 
you know, if you want to write something negative about it, that's fine. As long as I make you feel something, you know, that's the whole idea of reading is to, is to, is to generate those, those feelings. Um, so, and that's called, you know, part of the communication, which I mentioned before. So that's, that's important to me um, more so. That's why sometimes when you, look, when you read editorial reviews, these editorial reviews are like professional reviewers. They don't sit back after they read a book and go, how did I feel about that book? Instead, they go, what was wrong with that book? <laughs> so let's try to pick apart <laughs> certain things like you're going, really? That's what you're picking at? has nothing to do with the story. has nothing with, to do with how you feel about the story. But you want to pick on something maybe historically inaccurate that I, maybe I got wrong, which, okay, I'm not perfect. I could have gotten something wrong, but that's not – who cares? Okay, I'm not writing right. nonfiction. I'm writing fiction. Okay, so there's got to be a little bit of a leeway just from, from my storytelling perspective. So that's why I love reader reviews much more because they're honest. You know, they're about how someone uh, has an experience, you know, reading your words as opposed to an editorial review where they're trying to, you know, let's see what we could find wrong here. Yeah. Now, now where, where and when does um... – the Bomb Squad, and this will be your last book as, as we're coming down to less than 15 minutes in the day show, but where and when does The Bomb Squad take place? Well, The Bomb Squad takes place uh, also in New York, and it's right before uh, World War I. Well, World War I has broken out. It's 1914. Um, it, it's in New York. It's, 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 I call it The Clash of the Patriots. It's about two men, two German-Americans who live in New York, um, one is uh, Dr. Harold Schwartz. He is a, the administrator of Ellis Island Immigrant Hospital. Um, so you had Ellis Island where all the immigrants came in and had to go through customs and, you know, be interviewed and see who was sick or not before you got allowed in. And if you ever visit Ellis Island, you know, it's quite an oppressive place to go visit. Um, next to Ellis Island, on the same island, is an abandoned now, an abandoned hospital. But back in the day, Back when millions of people were coming in the early 1900s, that was the premier hospital in all of America. They had the, the best of doctors, the best health care, the best facilities there. And they were treating, I mean, it was just, it was a, it was a <laughs> just constant, constant, constant. Imagine people keep coming in and treated and they wanted to get them well and send them out into America. Or if they were too sick, they would send them back to Europe. So he was the administrator of this hospital, a German-American, but he was still loyal to the fatherland. And so he was basically a German spy in this pre prestigious position. And him and his father, who was uh, a lifelong friend of Kaiser Wilhelm, um, the, the, the leader of Germany at that time, um, uh, and uh, they were you know, basically trying to keep America distracted from entering World War I by, by blowing things up. And they thought by doing this, by causing havoc here, uh, in America, America would say, okay, we don't, what do we need this war for? You know, we have enough trouble here. Um, so meanwhile, we have another German-American, um, uh, Max Rothman, uh, who is a New York City police detective, and he is recruited by the British, British Secret Intelligence Service, known as the SIS, to uh, see what's going on, to stop this, these bombings, to investigate, and he is asked to begin what they call the bomb squad. So Max Rothman assembles these uh, men, four other men plus him, five men of German-speaking Americans to try to um, find out what's behind these unusual explosions um, going on throughout the New York metropolitan area. And there we have the bomb squad. Oh, my goodness. I love your overviews. I love your overviews. What, now, this is also set in New York and during World War One. What Neil, yeah. what attracts you to this time period? It's the second book that's set around World War I. Um, You know, I don't know. Um, I can't put my finger on one thing. I think I started – I like the Lower East Side story of the early 1900s. To me, it was fascinating to have all these people come here at one time and, and you know – and so many of them succeed. I mean, you know, we talk about immigration now, and we don't want these people, you know, don't let them come in. But, you know, back then, there was no passports. <laughs> there was no border control. There was none of that. And we had millions of people flocking in and made America who, who we are today. You know, and, and my God, how do we forget about those things? So to me, that, that fascinates me. You know, of course, you have good people and, and bad people coming in. But still, 
you know, overall in the whole scheme of things, you know, you know we had some uh, wonderful uh, people who have come, who came to this country from, from elsewhere. So I love those stories. I love I love the odds of trying to succeed um, against you know great adversaries and such. So um, that's what drew me to that time period. Um, so I don't know. Uh, you know, my next book that I'm thinking about writing is going to be about 5,000 years ago um, into, the, wow. into, into Europe. And it's going to be about Utsi the Iceman. I don't know if you've ever heard of Utsi the Iceman. But no. he was this, um, this um, hiker who was discovered uh, in the mountains of the Alps in the 90s. And he was almost perfectly preserved. So they were able to see what he ate and, and, the, and the tools and weapons he had. So I'm going to recreate his life. It's going to be told from the soul of Utsi, who was never released because his body was frozen on this mountainside. So it's going to be this journey of the soul trying to be released into the, into the, uh, to the next world, so to speak. Um, so it's just like it's the journey of the consciousness of Utsi the Iceman. Of all your books that you've written so far, which has been the most enjoyable to write? Mm. They're all fun. You know, it's, 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 I love just the, part, the process of writing. Um, each one is a wonderful process. And then when it's done, you know, it's there, and I, I, I reflect upon it every now and then about each one. And, you know, sometimes I forget about one and come back to it, or I, a, a review will come up and remind me about it. Um, but I have to keep reminding myself that the most important part about writing is the process of writing. You know, you can get caught up in the book sales and the recognition and all those other things. Um, but, you know, the most en- enjoyment I have is the writing part. The other part is stressful. I mean, why should I stress myself out about my book selling? And why should I stress myself out about being discovered and being the famous writer and all these things? Yeah, okay, if that happens, I'm, I'm, I'll, accept, I'll accept the fame, I'll accept the glory, I'll, I'll accept all of that. But I don't want to focus on that because that's so negative. It's really not the, the enjoyable part of writing. The enjoyable part of writing is is doing it, is coming up with a story, is not know what's coming next. Because I don't write with an outline. I, I come up with an idea. I come up with a situation. And, and then I have an idea of where I want to go. But I, sometimes it completely goes off track. And to me, that's, that's what I love. I, I, okay, what's going to happen next in my story? So that's what I prefer to focus on. Uh, you know, that kind of le- leads into the next question I was going to ask you, for, particularly for our listeners who might want to write a, no- a novel themselves, or they currently are, and they may want to sharpen their craft. I was going to ask you, what writing process do you follow? And you said you don't use outlines. Do you do character sketches, or do you just sit down? You said the idea comes to you. Do you just sit down and start writing, and and then it comes yeah. to And have you, have you ever, Neil, though, used the outline? I'm actually working on a a new novel myself, and I've, I, I didn't use, use so much an outline, but like bullets of what was going to happen in the story. And I, it, it seems like it's helping me to write the story faster. Um, but what's, what, do, you, do you generally just look at a blank piece of paper? You have an ideal mm-hmm. of what you want to say in the story, and you just start writing. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I'll keep track. I keep a little bit of a journal. Like I'll keep columns like chapter number, chapter name, who are my characters, what's happening in that chapter, and what point of view it's from. So I'll keep that chapter by chapter so I can refer back to it and say, okay. Or I'll make notes, okay, so uh, Percy handed Magnus the gold nugget back in chapter four. Don't forget about that because we have to make sure that nugget shows up later on in the book. Or if someone, I think, I forget who said it, it was some famous writer saying, if you show a gun in chapter two, you better make sure that gun goes off in chapter 22, something like that. You know, so you can't just, you know, introduce an idea. You can't mm-hmm. introduce, you know, any sort of item or whatever it is if it has no purpose of being there. So I have to make sure that I remember that I've done that in the past and, and, and make sure I, I bring that in later on into the story. So, so I'll keep notes based on those types of things. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, I'm out running. I run every day, and that's a good time to think of story ideas. I just – that's when they come to me, and I'll remember, oh, yeah, I have to make sure that we talk about that uh, her hair changed and, and the boyfriend needs to notice the hair in that scene. So things like that I'll, I'll, I'll make references to and notes and such, but that's really all I do. 
Now, can you share three to four steps that you've you found to be effective at getting the word out about your books? Well, I've done podcasts like this one. Um, so I've done I've done the, I've done lots of podcasts. I, I have a newsletter I send out monthly. Um, uh, what else do I do? I have a, I have a nice website which uh, promotes my all my work. Um, I, I have a page on Amazon too, as well. And actually, all my books too are, are are in all formats. I have them in ebook, I have them in paperback, and I have all my books on Audible too. So you can listen to my books as well. So you have all different types of way of experiencing the story. Um, so um, that's how I get it out there. Um, you know, I have. I, I reach out to different types of websites that that do share my story, so I get some links from their websites back to mine. Um, so you know, that's that's always a challenge uh, of getting out there because there's so many books out there, and so and now with self-publishing, anybody could put a book on Amazon. So you know, we're up against uh, you know a, a, an ocean of books, and we're just one little drop in that ocean. So you know, getting noticed is hard these days. As, as, as a writer, as it is in any art. I mean, as a painter, as a musician. I mean, you know, I've met musicians who should be performing, you know, on, on, on the greatest platforms that, that could be out there. And, and, they, and that's, that's not their real job. They work in computers or something. And meanwhile, they're like amazing artists and yes. never get recognition. Yeah, I've heard, and I've heard like singers that I was like, wow, when I heard people sing and, and, Professional, everything, and and but you would never, they would never, you would never know them if you. And all that talent is like, oh my goodness, everybody exactly. needs to hear you sing. Now, yeah, where can all right the shelf listeners get a copy of your books, Neil? You can go to Amazon. I mean, if you Google me or go to Amazon and, and put in Neil Perry Gordon, which is spelled my name right, N E I L, um, Neil Perry Gordon. And actually, my middle name Perry is a P, and in the Jewish religion. You use your your name with the, the first initial of a, a deceased relative. So, P was for Pincus. So I am named after my middle name is after Pincus from my 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 hero of book one. <laughs> so yeah, Neil Perry Gordon. Um, you could put that on Amazon, and you'll you'll find my books or neilperrygordon.com, and it'll take you to my website where you could also get links and click on to get my books as well. Are you do you have any upcoming speaking engagements? And if so, could you share some of your upcoming engagements with our off the shelf listeners? No, I don't. I mean, I I, I have nothing uh, planned right now. I mean, I, I do some um, different things. I think coming up in the fall, uh, I work with a publicist, so she's got me on some different events um, that um, I, I, I I couldn't even tell you what they are at the moment. But if you go to my website. You know, you'll see those events um, advertised as they come up. I also have a Facebook page, too, uh, where you'll find, find my uh, events as, as they do come up. So I know there's some fall ones coming up where I'll be part of the panels and such like that. Um, so, but I, I just can't tell you. I can't share those with you at the moment because I just don't know what they are. <laughs> and, if, and if you could tell us where we can find you on the social media networks, if you are on social media. Yeah, yeah, Facebook. You can find me. I have a nice Facebook page, so you can – you know, I'm also just go Neil Perry Gordon on Facebook, and you'll see my author page there. Okay, so you're on Facebook. And we have had the, oh, my goodness, I have so enjoyed you. I have enjoyed mm. this interview. I mean, I've been doing this 16 years. But, but here you talk about the towns and the characters and your overviews. I love when authors are so connected to their characters and their stories that when they talk about them, you just like I gotta go get that book. It's just <laughs> the way you talk about your, your, the towns and the characters. We have just had the absolute delight of of having Neil Gordon here on Off the Shelf this morning. He writes historical fiction, and his books include The Bomb Squad, A Cobbler's Tale, Moonflower, The Righteous One, and Hope City. And he's also working on a new book now. Please, please, please visit Neil online at Neil. PerryGordon.com. That's N E I L P E R R Y G O R D O N.com. Again, that's N E I L P E R R Y G O R D O N.com. I'll be sending a press release out about about uh, your your interview. I just so so enjoyed it, and and wish you well, and hope that uh, encourage mm-hmm. our listeners to go out and support you online and to get a copy of your books. Thank all of our listeners, including our loyal listeners who are here 
with us on Off the Shelf for 16 years. 16 years we've been on the air. So thank you to our loyal listeners and those who it might be your first time. Please come back. Set your set your calendar, your clock to Saturday mornings, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or New York City time, that you're going to catch Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio. We will bring other awesome authors like Neil Gordon here to introduce to you. And you can learn about these fascinating authors and their fascinating books. Thank you again so much, Neil. I really, really enjoyed your interview. And to to our listeners, as I always tell you, you are awesome. You are amazing. You are incredible. Go out and create a fabulous day for yourself. Neil, I'll shoot you an email with a link when the show finishes streaming. Bye for now. Thank you.